This is the Meat Eater Podcast. We're recording just outside of Casanova, Wisconsin, um, in the Driftless area of Wisconsin. Moments ago, I was asking my friend here, who's who's joining us today, along with Giannis Brutellis. That was a confusing sentence. I'm joined right now by Giannis Brutellis and Doug Dern, and moments ago, I was asking Doug Dern if he had heard the term Driftless area of Wisconsin as a child, or if it was just some kind of new marketing scam. And the answer is yes, but it really has become more prevalent in the last, you know, 10 to 15 years. Yeah, so where that term comes from is, is you know, during the ice ages, glaciers leveled the Midwest. You know, that's why it looks the way it does, flat and homogenous. Um, but the glaciers missed this spot. They, like, spread apart and split apart. They saw Doug standing there. In all of his hugeness, and the glaciers just didn't want to tangle with him and went around the driftless area and left it much topography. Like, we're pissing distance from a brook trout stream. Oh, yeah. Beautiful brook trout stream. We're a thousand yards, if, from where we just killed a turkey this morning. Oh, I would say we're 500 yards from there. From where we killed a turkey this morning. This morning, yeah. We're way closer to where Doug has downed a lot of nice bucks. Well, yeah, in fact, I one I downed that's hanging on the wall over there, which probably doesn't work on a podcast, but uh, <laughs> uh, it actually died right down here by the barn. Is that right? Oh, I know that story. Yeah. So, yeah, we're, we're in Doug, like Doug Dern's family for several generations has had this farm here um, going way back. 115 and years. 115 yeah. years in this farm. That's, we're recording in this old farmhouse. It's just full. they call it the buck shack now because it's full of giant bucks. Um, we're gonna talk a bunch about that. Oh, I was gonna tell you about the driftless area though. Yeah, yeah. I was up in up on Lake Superior, Ashland, Wisconsin. Sure. And the guy up there has got a sugar shack. This guy named Bill Hart, hell of a nice guy. Hmm. He's got a sugar shack up there, and he, in response to the driftless area in all of its coolness. He has on his bottles of maple syrup. He writes from the famed drifted area <laughs> of Wisconsin. <laughs> well, that's the great thing when you get a getting something, some kind of label or marketing thing going. You can they use try to take you ways. down. Yeah, man. that's right. They try yeah. to take you down. But yeah, this part of Wisconsin doesn't look like the normal mid. I mean, there's a ton of topography around here. Rock outcroppings. This used to be like Indians used to hide out here when they're trying to hide from oh, yeah. the army. Yeah. That's a great area. And 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 Giannis, who tell us, the Latvian lover and hunter, you guys got a Latvian camp not far from here. Mm-hmm. Talk about that. Why do the Latvians like this place? As far as I know, they they settled here when they all came over during the second well, some of them came over before the Second World War, but most of them emigrated during the Second World War, but it was very similar to Latvia's topography and landscape. So it felt like home. Yeah. There's only, uh, what, 3 million Latvians alive today? Something like that. 1 million in Latvia, 2 million in the U.S., is that right? I think 2 in Latvia and then a oh. million worldwide. So explain that place you hunt on. You don't need to give, like, the GPS coordinates, but. No, it's. It, very similar topography to here, you know, just beautiful oak ridges, you know, oak flats, you know, a lot of little bowls that just kind of, you know, peel off the main ridge. And uh, there's no ag. <clears throat> a lot of the neighbors have ag around us, but the country that we hunt, it's all just basically big oak forest. Yeah, it's a bunch of Latvian mugs who all bought property by each other to be by each other. Mm-hmm. And there's a Latvian It was pe- all owned once by maybe like one main Latvian guy. Oh. And then over the years, it got divided up but it stayed in the latvian community and there's a latvian pagan church camp yep spent a lot of time there growing up is there is there a lot of is there a lot of instruction involved with turning someone into a pagan no not much at all really you just kind of go with what seems very natural they teach you a lot about nature yes like um What's the word I'm looking for? I think we were talking about this word the other day. Yeah, it's definitely. Do so you find God in nature? Yeah, it's like uh, what's that? What's the word for it? Not po- like polytheism, multi gods. There's like a word for finding 
God in the land. Yeah, so there's, there's evidence there's, there's of God like, in the land. There's like the Wind Mother, and there's you know the um, uh, like the God that takes care of farm animals, and then there's like the God that watches over wild animals, and the like. There's just like kind of you know gods that kind of do their own little thing all about you in life. You know, I think animism might be the word I'm looking for. I can't believe Doug the fact checker Duran is a fact checker. Right you told me not to do that. So. Oh. <laughs> So, yeah, Yanni hunts turkeys near here, totally coincidentally. We came out, the way Wisconsin runs their turkey seasons is, and some dudes were complaining about this last night. I gave a talk at the university last night, and afterward, instead of waiting in line to meet me and shake my hand, Giannis went to a bar um, and got to yapping with some guys in a bar, and they were complaining about <laughs> the way Wisconsin runs their turkey seasons. But Wisconsin divide, has a, not, doesn't have a long turkey season but has many short turkey seasons that make up a long stretch of time. Yeah, I think there's So you guys six. got like A, B, C, D, F, and G season. I think there's an E in there also. And a youth season. <laughs> there's an How e? did he miss that? I don't know. You said six. I counted to six. A, B, but I thought C. That, but you didn't say E. Oh. Yeah, you just went F to G. G really? I think it's number seven. G. It does go F to G. The alphabet. You went D to F. D to, yeah. Oh, you right, skipped yeah. E. Um, Minor issue. Yeah, no, I, I, I'm not. I'm confident in my ability to say the alphabet. <laughs> <laughs> so when you put in, when you apply to hunt for turkeys in Wisconsin, you got to pick a zone. What's How many zones in the state? Well, I think there's only three or four now. I'd have to look at the You're map. zone one. Yeah, we're, we're zone one, and that's pretty much the whole southwest corner yeah um i don't remember what the and if you're a non-resident and you don't have any bonus points saved up and you put in for zone one season a you will not draw the tag as i now understand like i didn't draw it you might have a chance to draw it yeah but i didn't get it that's Um, that's to get the first crack but you don't just get the first crack because there's a youth season the weekend weekend. before that's who gets the first crack but that's almost like too early of a first crack they're not like hot well, birds. yeah, I guess, but um, uh, I know that people have pretty good success in it, and certainly the birds have been active the last yeah, two or three weeks. There's not a leaf on the trees, right? I mean, there's, there's like buds. They'll be probably, in two weeks, it'll look leafed out. No, no, no. No? We're two weeks probably from, uh, well, some of it will be like the softwoods, the willows and, and red maples will you know be getting there, but you know we're still waiting for that mouse ear size yeah. leaf on the oak when the morels will be up so it's a couple weeks off yeah we went out this morning just walked out of doug's farmhouse walked up the main valley here um to the end of the field heard one freaking gobbler and that was a long oh. ways off and i wasn't even sure it was a gobbler when it first when i first heard it. no it was so far away but i mean it certainly was but yeah. he didn't do anything by fly down time he had shut up yeah and we hunted our tuchuses off like Technical term? Yeah, at hunt, hunted our asses. I can't say we hunted our asses off. We listened around a fair bit and eventually called in two towns that didn't make a peep. We got one half gobble out of one of them. After we were staring at it for 20 minutes. Yeah, yeah. These, I, I was sitting there trying to get comfortable to take a nap. It was like getting that time of day, 9 in the morning. And I was like, couldn't get my head quite how I wanted it, you know, to sleep. And also, I noticed like the top of a tail fan, maybe seventy yards, eighty yards away. And there's two gobblers out there strutting that just never made a sound. You know, we had a decoy out, and we had to set it set at a little crossroad, uh, what you guys call the big woods, right? Yep. Um, had set a little crossroad, and those toms come in, saw the hen muscle, and just set to strutting. And then we kind of toyed around with them for a long time, and eventually they came in. Oh, it was a great. And they were convinced, man. He oh, they ready, were. He was yeah. ready to make love to that. Decoy. <laughs> yeah, there was... yeah, he was ready to make love to the decoy. Him and his buddy. That was just a great twenty minutes or half an hour of observing turkeys and watching them do what they want to do. And I kept thinking, can they see that decoy? And from yeah. where we were, we thought, well, maybe they couldn't see the decoy. So after we killed the one, uh, I walked up where they had been well they could clearly see the decoy yeah and they just uh they just had they they just waited they were waiting for her to come and and uh giving full credit to 
to Steve Ranella on the calling job, he was so subtle and so quiet. That's how I talked to a lady, even though I was talking to her. Smooth like yeah. butter. And, uh, and then he stopped because they, wouldn't, they didn't move for 20 minutes. They just were in full strut. Because I overcall. I overcall. My specialty is getting turkeys attention, and then once, they, once I got it, I feel like I'm like the puppeteer, man. It's so hard to shut up. Well, if they had been gobbling, it would have been impossible to shut up. Oh, yeah. That would have been fun. He's like, watch this. I'm going to make them gobble again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it was just one short. <laughs> it didn't even, wasn't even a full gobble. No. And, and then they, and then you shut like up. If you were out in the woods listening, you'd have heard that. It'd been like, I don't know. What was that? Yeah, yeah. It was just like a half-ass gobble. Yeah. But they were mature birds, you know. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. Yanni, give a, re- I, give a recap I, on your morning, man. I played hard to get on our second <laughs> setup this morning, and it did not work. It did not pan out. I was very confident because hard to get worked for me about four days ago in California, and he kind of cruised on the opposite side of the ridge that we were set up on. I heard him gobble four or five times as he went by. So he's just ripping up there. Well, we we called never it. heard a we. I would have thought we could hear your birds, but never heard that any of that. Yeah, there's a little bit of wind. I think it was actually blowing from you guys to us, so that would make sense. Oh, it was quiet. If there would have been birds gobbling, we would have heard them. This well, morning. that's not true because they, they were gobbling. By, yeah. Gobbling by, I mean, oh, in, by in, us. In, yeah, within yeah. a half a mile of us. But anyways, he gobbles. I've been calling every 10 or 15 minutes, just, you know, one little set of yelps. And I can hear him gobble by us. and kind of goes away, and I'm thinking, man, we're gonna, we'll give him one more call. If we can't turn him, we're going to have to go chase him. The next time he gobbles, he's like come up on top of the ridge. And then he gobbles again. He's a little bit closer. You're probably thinking you're going to kill the bird. Oh, yeah. At that point, I'm like, I'm going to give him one more soft little call. And I'm going to set the call down. And, and the next thing that's going to happen is, you know, Ty is going to pull the trigger. And I set that call down. And 30 minutes later, it was as quiet as it had been at that moment. And so it, it didn't work. You know, and I don't know if I, if I had called more had I pulled him in. An hour later, I think we ended up spooking that bird with either another gobbler or with a hen. Maybe he had two hens. I don't know. We spooked three birds not far from where we last heard gotcha. him. Did you so, see the bird? That bird? Not when, we were, not when I was working him. I saw him an hour later when we oh, spooked oh, but, him. But when you quit calling, you didn't see no. him? No. But when he gobbled, I was like, he is at 100 or less, uh-huh. and he's closing the distance. Leave him alone. Yeah. I'm just going to set the call down. Yeah. It's nice when a gobbler has the courtesy to <laughs> mm-hmm. gobble a lot when he loses interest. But let you know. Because then you can gauge, like, that son of a bitch is going the other way. And then you know just to, like, no holds barred. Right. Like, any, you know, it's like, what's to lose now? I'll just make insane noises. Yeah, yeah. You know, I'll be like, I'll do my hen dying noise, you know. Like, anything, because, but when they just shut up, you're thinking he shut up because he's coming to you. Like, you don't hear him for 15 minutes, like, it's got to be because he's walking over here. Yeah. You know? But then, like, you know, when nothing happens, you stand up and he's just gone. The other thing that happens, turkey hunt, we were talking about this the other day, is we used to hunt out west, you can sneak up on turkeys, you know. We used to get where you knew they were on the other side of the ridge, and you call and call and call, and nothing happens. You're like, oh, they must have wandered off, and you stand up, and they're still standing there. Be mm-hmm. like, you just suck at calling is the problem. <laughs> <laughs> they just don't care. Before um, we get on to farther turkey stories, let's uh, just take a quick break to our sponsors. Very smooth. All right, just yesterday I was talking to some uh, a couple of gals, my wife included, who who want to come out on their first hunting trip, and I was telling them they're like worried about guns and backpacks, and I was telling them what you need to worry about is getting in good shape, like hunting in the mountains. What makes or ruins your hunt is whether you're in good shape and whether you got good boots and you broke them in properly. Like blisters and exhaustion kill hunts. You know, the lack of blisters and physical fitness kills game. The other stuff kills hunts. You got to be in good shape. If you're hunting like Texas corn feeders, it don't matter. You just eat, drink what you want. You don't need to exercise, take naps up there, play video games. But if you're hunting in the mountains, you're on the move, man, and you got to be in good shape. And it's hard for people to tell, like, what is good shape, you know? So the Meat Eater podcast is brought to you in part by someone who, who who can help you get where you need to be, and it's the Spree Smart Cap. This deal looks and feels like a regular running hat, all right? But it lets you track a lot more than your steps. When you put the hat on, 
and it comes with an app, right, that communicates seamlessly with your iOS or Android smartphone. You put on this hat, and it tells you your heart rate, your body temperature, distance traveled, speed, time, and calories burned, and it tells you when you're hitting your ultimate stride. The thing uses patented biosensor technology to measure directly from your forehead, so you can ditch those, like, weird, irritating chest straps and armbands that don't really do what they say you're going to do. And like I said, the Spree Smart Cap includes an easy-to-use app that ties right into your smartphone. You'll learn when your body's burning the most calories and at what pace you are achieving maximum endurance. So with this thing, there's less of a reason for you to fall short of your fitness goals. Use your head and find out why Spree Smart Cap has been called the world's smartest fitness monitor. No wires, no chest strap, no wristwatch. You just put the hat on like your normal hat and go. And if you start now messing around with this thing and figuring out where you're at, where your body's at, and where it needs to be, you'll be more ready for this fall and you'll be having more fun and complaining less. Visit spreewearables.com for more information. So that's spree, S-P-R-E-E, wearables.com for more information. My other morning setup, I just got very lucky. We heard birds gobbling on a classic like point off of a field. They were up above us. You had like a season's worth of turkey hunt this morning. And we got had a lot of good turkey hunt this morning. And we got in right underneath them at the bottom. And I think they flew down into the field kind of away from us. And we had time to drop a decoy in sit against a tree and I looked back up on the horizon. I could see, you know, them moving and I made one little scratch and they were walking down the hill and it just happened to be that they were going to come right down that. Well, how do you know that? I don't, but it just seemed like, you know, they were very confidently coming down that hill. I don't, they couldn't see the decoy at that point. You don't think they're, well, you you just never know. You never know. That's the problem too with hunt. I've hunted a lot of stuff, but hunting turkeys is like, you're always doing stuff. You don't know. Like today I could say, well, once those, Two that were, I don't want to say they were hung up because they weren't like suspicious. They were just strutting out of range. Once I started being like, okay, I'm just going to scratch the leaves and purr, right? And eventually they came in. So now do you sit and go like, oh, the trick. The trick is to scratch the leaves and purr. Or was it just that they came in even though I was doing that? You know, it's so hard to, you got to see things happen again and again and again and again and again before you start formulating an idea. But I'm coming to see that shutting up, when you got a bird that's just, he's responding, he likes what he hears, it's in your best, as as fun as it is just to get him, to keep him talking, it's just give it 10 minutes, give it 15 minutes now and then, and see if that doesn't move that bird way in your direction. And that 10 minutes, when we sat there, was both really short. And really long. It just you seemed have like, for, I, and I did. Without not, having a watch, you can't tell. Yeah. You can't tell. And I was, I how look. long is this going on? Yeah. But it was, you know, just to watch him. I mean, that was the visual on that was, you know, it kept your interest in the numbness of my leg and shoulder and my neck up against the tree. It, it all went away. Oh, just checking those birds out, man. Yeah. I was saying after that was over, if you're like hunting turkeys, man. Yeah. Uh, I can't tell you what I said. I said, if you don't like turkeys, you can. Expletive deleted. Yeah. Exactly. You can. Eh, my. Mm. Yeah. Um. So, yeah, Durance Farm. Now, tell these guys, tell listeners about, like, when you were a kid, about uh, the deer situation out here. I remember. This is a, this is a way ass interesting story. Wow, that's uh, I'm laying pressure on serious pressure Steve. on Doug Dern. <laughs> uh, it was a big deal when I was a kid. You saw a deer out in the field. I mean, you got in the car and drove. I mean, somebody said, hey, there were some deer out on McGlynn's Ridge or Cunningham Ridge or something like that. You drove out there and checked it out. Um, the deer in this area were over in the, the, the Baraboo Bluffs, the Baraboo Hills. Um, prior to that, I remember my brother David did a uh, – a speech, a conservation speech, when he was in seventh or eighth grade about the management of the white-tailed deer. Was he an expert? No, but he was doing one of those, you know, competitions at school or whatever. Yep. And uh, he did a great job of it, as I recall, under some 
very difficult circumstances. Should I tell you what that was? He got kicked in the groin and was all swollen up. And <laughs> and the night that he gave that speech was in incredible pain. Is that right? Yeah. And he did a great job of it. I think he got second place. I'm sure he'd have won it had he not been. Had he not taken a blow to the groin. <laughs> blow to the, yeah. But uh, through the uh, management program of the, of the uh, Department of Natural Resources, um, it, when I was a kid, you would, you'd have to, if you wanted to shoot a doe, you'd have to have, get four guys together like months ahead of time and send in for a party permit. So one guy, or you would get one doe tag for four guys. So your deer tag was a buck tag. Um, and then there would be this one tag for four guys to be able to shoot a doe. You know, let, let me interrupt you because I realize I'm, I'm doing a bad job of, of hosting right now. So was, just for people who live in other areas or, or who don't follow this kind of thing, this area right now, like right now is the good old days on, on deer. Or maybe a couple of years ago is the good old days. No, no, I, I would say right. Uh, uh, it's just this place produces tons of deer, and it's famous in becoming – It's famous. More famous, yeah. For, for gigantic bucks. And we should be able to produce more of them. And I, I, I don't know how I'll hop on a soapbox I want to get about, you know, deer management. We have too many deer, in my opinion, and where I hunt and what I yeah, have. Yeah, because you guys are in the these, – these, this area is also part of the CWD, the chronic wasting disease zone. We're on the northern edge of it. And yeah. chronic wasting disease goes hand in hand with shitloads of deer. I mean, you don't get CWD in an area that doesn't have a lot of deer. That's right. High deer density makes a big difference. And and then to control the diseases, you want fewer deer. And um, there are a lot of reasons to to have fewer deer in this area. And and again, I you know I don't know what other guys' experiences are in, in various parts of the state and all that. I just know around here, and on the land that I'm hunting, which is our farm and a little bit, uh, and the area around it. I'm not hunting that, but seeing it, we have way more deer than than what we should have and uh from a forestry perspective from a well right I mean, it depends if what you want to see is a ton of deer i guess you should be happy as a clam but um uh if you want to have deer in the future then we should have fewer deer now we're gonna i mean it's possible that we'd have a crash of the of yeah. the deer here herd here because uh because our habitat will be depleted um, I'm sure there are guys who are gonna, you know, from around here go. Oh, oh people that's... shoot each other over this discussion. Oh this yeah, guy. yeah, yeah. No, it's a heated discussion, and and I, I still think. See, I'm old enough. I'm 56 years old, and I'm old enough that there are guys in my generation who won't shoot a doe. And you know, it's just that way. You don't do that. Oh, I know tons of old guys like that because they come from the day when there weren't any deer around. Well, right, but the mentality, I mean you have to shift that mentality to a certain a lot of a lot has changed about deer hunting and one of the things is the numbers. But, on, but I want to back up. Yeah, yeah, I know. You're, I, want, kind of, I was just trying to set the stage that right now there's a ton of deer, giant bucks for this area right now is the good old days of deer hunting. Yeah. Now. Look around. Yeah. I was ba- yeah, I mean look at this I wish you could see this room in. Like I'm staring eye to eye right now with the buck known as the standard. I don't want to talk about the standard because that, that's that to me in the story of this area, like the standard at, at, for you too, like that deer sort of like, is this like a sort of the epitome? Yeah. Of, it's like yeah. this really important moment in this area. So Doug was growing up. It'd be a big deal to cut a deer track. You now live like your family lives in. I mean, if you're going to sit down and list like top 10 whitetail locations in the U S you'd probably one of them would be around here. And your old man always drove north of here. Yeah. Dad always went up north. He hunted. Uh, there's still guys from this area that go up there for the tradition of it. Uh, he went up and, and hunted up in Phillips. They lived in a tent for, you know, a week or 10 days. Um, and then when I was a kid, uh, 12 years old, we uh, hunted up in that area. And then we hunted by um, Red Granite. Because um, Dad wanted us to have that north woods, yeah. you know, experience and all that. Hunting, uh, hunting like pulpwood. Country. Yeah. Yeah. And alder swamps and that kind of stuff. And uh, cedar swamps. And uh, I think the first three years that I deer hunted, I saw three deer. And then I started playing high school basketball. Yeah, Doug's big, tall bastard. (laughs) Anyway, (laughs) well, around, uh, anyway, so I started playing high school basketball. And so you had to be here. And so then we started hunting the farm. And I went out opening day and shot first buck. 
you know, 14 right? years old. Bang, there's a buck. After, shoot drive, it after driving yeah. how many hours? Well, what the hell are we going up there for? Um, and I, you know, and, and as I say, I appreciated that, that experience and everything. But, you know, in terms of just really getting to hunt deer, this is the place to do it. Um, and that, But that was like a little surprising then. You were like, oh, wow, there was deer here all along. It was like coming. It into... was all happening at the same time. Yeah. I was getting to like the what age. What year was that? Uh, 70, mid 70s, early 70s, 73. I'd have but, been 14 and 73. But there weren't mature bucks running around. There, no, right? no. It had a horn on it. You shot it. But it was still the party tag thing. So all you could shoot were bucks, cause, you know, unless you had the party tag. Um, and, you know, I got involved with that with some other guys. Um, and if those guys are listening right now. They're chuckling about it. But um, so anything with an antler on it, you shot. And really... That was the mentality here for a long time. And in the 80s, when the deer herd really started to explode, and I didn't live here from 1985 until uh, 1990. So there was, I lived in New England for a few years and, and actually didn't deer hunt for five years. Uh, <clears throat> so then um, came back in the 90s and, you know, um, a, you know, two and a half year old uh, six pointer or eight pointer, maybe it was a year and a half old buck. Uh, probably couldn't have been, but that was a, you know, 110 inches or something like that. For those of you who know what how big that is, that was a big deal. That's at that same time, late 80s, early 90s, like when I started hunting. I guess I did my first league. I killed my first deer, and I was 13. Um, you shot. This is in West Michigan, so just across Lake Michigan from Milwaukee. You shot. If you saw a buck, you shot that thing. Oh, yeah, and that was the mentality here, too. My yeah. old man killed a two-and-a-half-year-old buck, like a nice eight-point, okay, two-and-a-half years old. That, song, that deer was in the newspaper. Yeah. You, it's like you did not – bucks just didn't live. I think that the year-and-a-half-old bucks would do it all the – were breeding all the does. Yeah. Because there were – it's just – you just shot – you would sit there and you'd see does come out at dusk. You'd sit there – just like hallucinating spike <laughs> antlers on them. Behind the ears. It's like it's got I'd have been be a horn spike, stuck you know? in there behind that ear. Yeah, yeah. it's like you just shot bucks. And I understand. <laughs> I'm not even down on it, man. I, I understand it's like super complicated. But if you saw a buck, if you killed a fork, you had a fantastic year. First buck I hunt. shot had one antler, and I was on cloud nine. That was the buck you shot when you started basketball. Yeah. Yeah. Where'd you start hunting? Yanni? Just 40 miles north of here. Oh, that was your deer hunting too? Well, we hunted in southwest Michigan and over here. Um, I think in Michigan we could start hunting at 12, and here it was 14. Back no, back. no. It's always been 12 here. 14 with a gun, 12 with a bow. Michigan too. Michigan's 14 with, was 14 with a gun and when we were What kids. was the age 12 here? with a gun here. Oh, so I had it mixed up. Because I killed my first deer with a gun before I was supposed to. Mm. Yeah. I was 13. The statute of limitations of, has run out on that violation. I hope. <laughs> Plus, they changed the rules now, I think. You know, it wasn't my fault. At that age, you're like, you're sort of an instrument of your father. Oh, yeah. You're not like a, I think the Bible says when you're old enough to like, not butter bread, but like <laughs> at what age are you capable of reason? I don't know. Anyhow, if I had murdered someone, then I'd be out of jail a long time ago by now. You know, so you're, when you're 13, you're just not held responsible. Um. You guys, were you guys just shooting teeny bucks then? You know, I was going to say, it's interesting because it, <clears throat> that time period too, so I started hunting probably around like late 80s, early 90s too. Must have been 78, so 82, 80, 82. I think I killed like a little crotch one my first year. But those early years and the five years before I actually started holding the, carrying a gun, just coming out here with my dad, I remember those – memories fondly of driving in we'd always come in it would be late it'd be 9 10 p.m and every big field within like the last five miles of getting to camp we would swing the headlights onto the field and just yeah. start counting you know that was like i look forward to that you know that was like so exciting Cause, and we'd count oftentimes you'd hit over 20 you know on yeah. one field you know just deer yeah. everywhere and as the years went on it got to be less and less and less and less and right now i mean i haven't been back in probably four or five years in the last couple of times I've gone back, I had one hunt where I went back and hunted three and a half days hard and did not see a deer. Nowadays. Not a deer. 
Yeah, like five years ago. And they're having tough hunting right now up there right now. And a lot of them ha- are blaming it on the, you know, being in that T zone. They've had some tough weather too. And again, these guys only hunt the opening weekend. I think I want to say last year, right? Did, if you right hunted the- only opening weekend last year, you didn't see any deer. Right. I, it was I, foggy the whole time. It right? was, fo- yeah, I remember I was texting you. Yeah. You were out. Rain and rain, yeah. fog, snow, and I mean, driving snow. The first three day, days on this farm, you know how many deer there are around here. I'm sitting up there comfortably in a box blind, comfortably sunrise to sunset. And I saw six deer in the first three days. And I didn't think anything of it. Like, yeah, they just they're just not out. Not it's moving. not happening. Yeah. Uh, after uh, Thanksgiving Day, killed a doe on Thanksgiving Day, killed two bucks on the next day. We saw tons of deer. And then when we hunted, I had a bunch of friends uh, come out over the uh, holiday hunt. All famous people. All famous people from Casanova. <laughs> uh, certainly the my favorite, some of my favorite people, not all of my favorite people from Casanova, but, but certainly some of them and their kids. And in the course of three hours, no joke, 75 or 80 deer. Is that right? Yeah. We killed only two, but um, uh, but that that amount of deer. There's – so, you know, you're just talking about, well, how has deer hunting changed and, you know, and all that. So the numbers are different, but the other part of it is you can hunt in a lot of different places, and I control this land, you know, I mean – I've had I, last year. I had over thirty people deer hunt out here over the course of the seasons. Is that right? Yeah, you know, different, various, you know. Yeah, that's nice. That's really nice. And me. they weren't all famous. Doug got accused of uh, only letting famous people. <laughs> we filmed out here and, and had some famous people out hunting here, and Doug got accused of only letting famous people hunt his land. And then the guy down the bar stool commented that just the other day, Doug had ten people out there, and he sure as hell ain't famous. <laughs> <laughs> so. uh now you got me. Uh, no, I'm glad I got you because I want to. I want to. You know, change the track. No, I don't want to change the subject. I have a quick question though for you, Doug. Do you yeah. feel like just 40 miles north of here, it could be a, a, a big difference of what go, is going on here? Yes, because you are kind of micromanaging. Just you know, your I don't spot think here. it's me micromanaging this spot. I so, I yes, I I feel like that could happen, especially when you said, "Well, there's egg around." I don't know what's going on up there. Yeah. Um, I think there's been some good changes to deer management. I think some of the bad changes have been, um, you know, they took away the Ernebuck, uh from the biologists to, you know, to to, uh, to help manage the herd. Yeah, hold, hold, hold. Uh, I want to explain the Ernebuck. All right. To encourage people, to encourage hunters to shoot does, right, if you're trying to reduce the population and also take pressure off of bucks, you know, Wildlife managers use a tool called earn a buck where um, you can't shoot a buck unless you shoot a doe first. That's right. right. Yep. So if you th- just think about, I, I don't want to dwell on this subject too long, but deer are born basically like, like humans, a one to one sex ratio. Okay. For every doe that drops or every doe fawn that drops out of a doe, a buck fawn is going to drop out of one. Yep. It's 51% or 50, 50. Humans are 51% female. Deer is somewhere right in there. Mm -hmm. And when you're sitting out there and you see 25 does and one buck, you're looking at, you're not seeing a natural population dynamic. If what you're seeing is actually representative of what's there, you're not seeing a natural dynamic. There would be a healthy most people who understand why tail deer would say that a healthy population of deer the ratio is not that skewed a high buck to doe ratio yeah I, it's I, never going to be it's never going to be one to one because they just have they just have an easier time dying and they don't live as long bucks don't but it should be substantial well uh i was talking so anyways i, I don't want to i don't want i just want to explain like earn a buck people are gonna be like what the hell does that mean so anyways yeah yeah, yeah. They, they got rid of earn a buck so and I understand why they did because there's places like Johnny was talking about that uh, where that was what maybe the blame was placed on right. why there are fewer deer. Uh, I, even though I've hunted with some DNR guys, I've never seen a DNR guy kill a deer 
hunters kill deer. So at the end of the day, it's always the hunters who are going to be managing the deer. Yeah. And that's, you know, it's, and, and that's the mentality that I have here. I do what I think is right for our property um, based on the guidelines or based on the seasons and the structure that, that those, uh, that the, the, the deer managers have. I thought earn a buck was a good thing. We still have it here. I mean, we shoot more does than we shoot bucks here. Um, uh, and, and the liberal, uh, and I mean, liberal, lots of, uh, uh, doe tags certainly could be a reason for it. Weather's a reason for it. Um, but that's, you know, management within a particular area, I guess, is the way I feel that, you know, the hunters are, are way more in control of that. And I think some of the changes that have happened in the in deer management have been good, but, um, I, I still have an awful lot of faith in, in, uh, the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources, big game managers, and how they put, you know, season structures together. I like the fact that we've shrunk. It used to be really big zones, sort of like it is with Turkey, with much bigger zones. Yeah. Now it's going much more on a county-to-county basis, mm -hmm. and I think that's going to take into account more of that. You know, you, you get an area like where you're hunting up there where there are fewer deer. Well, why is that? Well, I'm not exactly sure because I don't, I don't hunt there, but you guys should have a better feeling for that. Right. That's the thing. These eastern states, like the state I grew up in, zone one, two, three. So all of Michigan, right? You got the whole state, 83 counties, and they would break it up into three units. Basically divide the lower peninsula in half and make the UP its own unit. You go out west, they draw units by watersheds. You yeah. know, you look at the state and be like, there's 300 units in the state. Yeah. Because you're fine-tuning your management plan in a way that allows you to account for all these little micro things. Like, you take the area you to talk about and be like, well, you know what? That spot doesn't have any deer. It's a great management tool if you can be like, okay, so let's talk about that spot and not talk about this whole half of the damn state. Yeah. You yeah. know? Because it, it just really allows you to get into it. There's a guy, I think it was Frederick Jackson Turner. There was some environmental historian. who He went back and argued if we really wanted – this is way off topic. But he went and argued if we, want, we really wanted to govern the country in a better way, We'd get rid of the state lines we have now and draw our states according to watersheds. Hmm. Actually, Talk really about like government it. that way. Yeah. You know, and give people a sense rather than having these arbitrary straight lines cutting through things that shouldn't be cut through. Like you, you live in a, and it wasn't always watersheds, but you live in like a specific like geo region. Yeah. Yeah. Right? You know, well, think about it. The back of our farm, the, the, uh, where my cabin is and the pond up there, that's in a different county. That's in a different well, right? deer management zone now. Oh. Yeah, the pond is essentially the yeah. that that runs north south. That's the Richland Sock County line. So that's in a different management zone now. Well, there's always going to be some art. Well, you're, that's you're exactly right. Draw, just, you're always going to draw a line. Like when you draw that line, it's going to cut through a damn deer. Yeah, right. right. Like half the deer is going to yeah. be. There's probably deer right now. Half of them is on one management. But if you took your deer. premise and said the watershed, well, yeah, hell, we're different. talking about the same little valley there. Yeah, no, I'm you know? with you. I'm with and, you. And uh, that's where they draw a lot of uh, management. But, but again, I'm trying to like pry a narrative out of Doug here, and I keep um, teasing it out and then stomping on it when he gets into it. I kind of want I want to get into the whole like better nice buck next year. Nice buck next year. So oh, nice buck next year sounds very interesting. And to keep these podcasts coming to you for free, we're going to take thirty seconds to listen to our sixty seconds. Sixty seconds. Yeah. Some info from our supporters. The Meat Eater Podcast is brought to you by Fracture. Fracture is a company that prints photos directly onto glass, which has been described as being like hanging an iPad on the wall. It really is. Like every guy I know that likes to hunt and fish walks around with a bunch of hunting and fishing pictures on their phone, you know, and they flip through them. But the days of having like awesome pictures hanging on your wall are kind of coming to an end, and they shouldn't be because you it can look as good as as a computer screen when you get your pictures done by fracture the colors pop like you won't believe and it even comes on a solid backing that's ready to mount right out of the package all you got to do is stick a screw in the wall and hang it and these guys even give you a screw it's all really affordable too with prices starting at 15 bucks for the small square size again this is photos printed on glass by fracture and they make fantastic gifts for family and friends, or in my opinion, if a buddy of yours, you know, hooks you up on a great trip and you get home, you want to send them like a, a token of your appreciation. It's really cool to take the best shot you got from the trip 
get it made like this and send it to them and say like, Hey man, you know, hope we can do it again next year. It like, it really pays off. It's inexpensive. It's thoughtful. And it's a great way to share and celebrate a memory with someone. And it's also unique and modern. Each fracture is hand assembled and checked for quality by their small team in Gainesville, Florida. If you needed another reason to buy one besides them being meat eater podcast sponsors, and besides them making awesome pictures that you can hang on your wall that look modern and phenomenal and, like I said, as great as the screen of an iPad, you can get 15% off your first purchase with the code meat eater. Just go to fracture.me to check it out online. That's fracture, like break, fracture, fracture.me to check it out online. All right, so... There, back in time, there weren't shit for deer around here. Then there started to be getting a lot of deer here in the Driftless area. And everyone shot every buck they saw on site. Right. And then we went to the Doug's this... late brother. Matthew. Matthew. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. I just My, my new son's name, Matthew. Yes, he How is. How did he make that connection? Doug's late brother says what, Doug? So... Uh, out at the milk barn. So yeah, this deer that I was telling you that I killed within a stone's throw. Of this this or it died, I should say, within a stone's throw of the uh, of the house here was a. You can't see it, but it's that one with the black velvet up there on the on the. And that was the biggest buck that I had killed to date. You know, at that point, by a it's long a nice shot. little palmated eight point, um, it, like you know. That's got to be a like two-year-old a sweet deer. looking buck. Yeah, yeah. Like a lot of guys. I mean, shit. I'd be. I mean, it's like a cool buck. But anyhow, I shot it across the road. It jumps the creek, lung shot, jumps the creek, goes through the gate that we walked through this morning. There was no gate at the bottom of the hill then. Crosses the road, come up, comes up through these pines. Matthew is sleeping upstairs because he already got his buck, and he looks out the window, thinks I'm like messing with him because where I, I shot it over. Anyway, it ran down through here, and he. He thinks I'm messing Your with him. Your bullet went through the bedroom, didn't it? <laughs> no, it did not. <laughs> there was some very, there were some very quick but correct decisions made about the shots that were taken. <laughs> and uh, he looked out the window of the upstairs bedroom and saw that deer coming up through the pine trees out, <laughs> outside here. Comes down the stairs, grabs his deer rifle. In his long handles. And he's got his long johns on, grabs his deer rifle and his orange jacket. So he's legal. Comes out the door. That hole that's in that porch door out there was from that day, which is 20 years ago, 21 years ago. That deer goes over, goes in between the silos over there, lays down, and it, but it's still alive. It's you know it wasn't hard shot. It was long shot. So and so we go around and you know safety conscious as we were, we're trying to finish it off. And my dad is walking across the top of the hill. And he wonders what the hell is going on. Comes down the hill. Uh, Matt and I are, you know, trying to get the deer out of there, and it gets up and it goes down by the milk house, and kind of collapses again. And and you know, it's we're thinking, well, we should slit its throat. We got to be safe here. My dad walks up to it, blam, shoots it through the neck. Stuff's get, you know, thinking, well, we were doing the right thing. He says, for God's sakes, you know. So anyway, there was quite a lot of excitement, and uh, boy, you know, so we're all congratulating each other and talking about how this whole thing went down and grabbing the deer and I'm looking at it and I'm going, man, what a great buck. And I'm, you know, dad's like, well, that's terrific. And Matt, who was the quietest of all of us kind of looks at it and goes, yeah, but that'd have been a nice buck next year. And that really, that conversation that came from that ended up being really where we started doing bigger buck management here. Um, Just letting them slide. Well, it, what I started thinking then was, well, okay, that's the biggest I've, buck I've shot to date. The next one's going to be bigger than that. And we started talking about it. Unfortunately, he um, died three months later in a car accident just right down here on the on the highway. But uh, we started talking about that was what we had been planning that whole winter. It was more of our management at that point. And uh, in 2003, after um, some changes in the group that hunted here, uh, after I'd instituted some rules, um, everything that you see in here has been 
shot other than that buck has been shot since 2003, plus four or five others. And I know you go, well, I'm sorry, I guess I'm not describing it very well, but you can see the progression sort of. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, to give you an idea, that the one with the black velvet that Doug shot there 21 years ago out in the backyard here, he might be 100 inches, right? Yeah, he's might most, be 100. Most people call a basket rack, although he's a little bit wider than your average basket rack. But, uh, yeah, in our camp in Michigan, we would have been tickled to shoot a buck like that. I never shot a buck like that in Michigan. Yeah? No. Um, yeah, and, and you're, every, you're, good, every, you're good at numbers. Go around the room and just shout <laughs> out numbers. <laughs> well, uh, uh, there's a couple others that are, like, in that one, like, 20-type class, but not many. Everything else jumps significantly, significantly up into the 130s, 140s. Right? I mean, there might be a couple of 120s hanging These are there. like the, the upper row over there is like one, you know, mid-130s. Yeah. Uh, and then there's just some gigantor 140, 150 bucks. And then, of course, the standard. Are we ready to talk about him yet? No, we'll talk about standard in a minute. But I want to point out here, because this is an important fact to point out. All this talk about big bucks and age structure, right, demographics. Like, I almost forget to bring this up, but it really needs to be stressed. The, the, the poundage of, of venison, the poundage of meat coming off the property is increasing through all this. Absolutely. It's not like you're going like, oh, we, you know, we used to shoot deer and eat some venison, but then we decided to piss on that, and now we just shoot a giant buck now and then. You're still talking about, like, all the deer meat you want because you're shooting does. More than – more than – We've had, I mean, I have friends, non-hunting friends who are like, hey, if you get an extra deer, if you have, you know, I'd like to get some venison. I said, well, I, I, you know, I'll drop, a, I'll drop one off at the, at the, uh, the butcher for you. you yeah. Know? I'll gut it out and drag it down there. And, and, and so I do that. Um, like I said, in the late season, I had, you know, friends out here. Uh, I, I told those guys that day, let's shoot six or eight does. And we only got two, but, um. That wasn't because there wasn't some other shooting done. Uh, and those left. I mean, yeah, I mean, I have all the venison I want all the, yeah. you know, all the time. That's what I'm saying. Like, in simplified terms, you might look at it that when I, when I was growing up, you'd sit there and see a bazillion does praying that you'd see a buck. Any buck anyone saw, they'd kill. Another way of looking at it, I mean, to the point where you'd have 20 does for every buck running around. Yeah. Another way of looking at it would be shoot does. Let a lot of those small bucks walk. You're still filling your freezer. After a couple years, I mean, this is grossly simplified, but after a couple years, you might be that you're still shooting does and putting meat in the freezer, and now and then, bam, you shoot a buck that's like the old days. Yeah. A buck that just got old. Mm -hmm. You know, that was allowed to reach maturity. A it, three or four year old dominant buck. Yeah, and the interesting thing uh, to me is that that the buck that I shot on Friday of last year that measures a you know, nine pointer measures a, about 150 inches was aged by an expert at two and a half years. And when I looked at the teeth and knowing what I know about it, I said, "Yeah, I can't disagree with you." So what's happening there? Well. Maybe genetic selection, but also, um, I, well, I think that's a part of it, but I think there's a herd health component. I, I meant to tell you this earlier that I talked with uh, Keith uh, Warnicky. I hope I'm pronouncing his right, who's one of the big game managers. He, in fact, he's, um, I think he's ahead of it uh, for uh, DNR. And we were talking, I, I was talking with him about that. And uh, he was explaining to me that statistics show that there in, in, especially in Southwest Wisconsin, that the uh, average size of the buck increases, bucks taken increases dramatically with the uh, number of does taken in the same Sarah. area. Yeah. It makes sense to me. We had a, a, a bit of an infamous character. I, I don't like to speak ill of the dead, but a bit of an infamous character who was, uh, uh, live south of us here. That's the only people I like to speak ill of is the dead because you don't got to worry about them. <laughs> All right. Well, you don't got to worry about them coming 
back at you. Yeah, well, anyway, yeah, his but name was Randy Hako, a guy right? that I grew up with, and, and he, as I said, he was a bit of an infamous character, but he uh, owned the farm just to the south of us here and got a bunch of ag tags, and he shot 21... Did crop damage tags. Crop damage tags, yeah, ag tags. Yep. Yep, thank you. Uh, he shot 21 deer, antlerless deer, one winter, and the next year is when that top row over there, which is the 135, 140-inch deer, started showing up. And I told that to Keith last night, and he goes, that's what we're seeing. And I believe, I mean, so he has the, the, the data, the scientific data that shows that. I'm telling you, I've got the anecdotal yep. uh, stories that that's what happened here, too. So, you know, I believe that, and, and, and I believe that in, in my situation in this surrounding area, um, there's a, a road on the backside of the farm. It's about three miles long. You can take a, uh, it's a town road and you can take that drive in the, in the late winter or the early spring in the evening and see a hundred deer. And that's just too many deer. And those aren't all living on my farm. I mean, they're living all over the place, you know, but yeah. too many, like, like def- define what you mean too many. Cause here's the thing. Here's the thing I often catch myself saying. I catch myself saying, here's the thing I purposefully say now and then. Someone talks about, like, oh, deer are overpopulated. Mm -hmm. I'd be like, from whose perspective? Car insurance companies? Sure, overpopulated. Agricultural interests? Sure, overpopulated. Car insurance, because they don't want to pay out premiums to people who are getting deer. Yeah, busting their car up on deer. Ag interests, because they're losing crop damage. Or insurers who are insuring crops, and, you know, someone's paying, right? So I'd be like, from my perspective, how can I say deer overpopulated? In fact, there is a thing from a hunter's perspective. There is such thing as overpopulation. We touched on this earlier, but it just has to do with forest quality, has to do with other species. Right. You know, like it, explain a little bit of that. Like, t- and I, I want to get to talk about the state. We got too much to talk about. I want to talk about the standard, but talk a little bit about like your work trying to bring back certain native trees on your property. And how that ties into like rough grouse, how that ties into forest health, sure, whitetails, turkeys, all that BS. So uh, our woods here is predominantly uh, the hardwoods, but our predominant species are red and, and red and white oak, and you have seen the popple stands out there as well, or aspen stands. Uh, there's shagbark, hickory, and a few others. But in the driftless area, the biggest component of the woods that we are in danger of losing is the red and white oak because we don't have the fires and some of the things that brought that on um, years ago. So as a part of our management plan of our woods, we're cutting in a shelter, what's called a shelter wood harvest. It's a particular method of, of managing the woods. Uh, up in our big woods, we're cutting the trees that were little trees when my great grandfather bought this place. And, you know, yeah, I, I want to interrupt say, Doug, uh, besides doing this, I, Doug, on, on, besides doing land management on your own land, as a profession, Doug does land management. That's right. So um, this isn't just – he says anecdotal, but I just want you, the audience, to realize that Doug is a is very studied, a professional land manager. So so take – as he's talking, keep that in mind. But this isn't just some dude – Making that shit about, up. Yeah. talking about his, what he's seen on his 100 acres. He's downselling – He's downselling what his role in this and his background in this. Well, but I've also I rely greatly on um, foresters and uh, ecologists, and and you know I I think the thing that I know more than anything is is to be able to take information from different people and, and understand it. But anyway, yeah, red oak's going to shit. Red oak's going. Yeah, we're we're losing red oak. Well, so deer hunters and turkey hunters know that that uh, deer love white oak acorns. And they love to browse on red oak seedlings. So uh, we did a planting up on a 14 acres uh, up here behind the buildings where we planted, and it was a, a CRP planting, every other row, red, uh, red oak, white pine. And the idea was that the white pine would train the red oak to grow tall and straight and become quality hardwood. Well, what happened? For competition for sunlight. Yeah, for competition for sun, sunlight, and it would, you know, train them. And so what ended up happening is we created almost the perfect scenario for uh, white-tailed deer. We've got... They bed and feed in the <laughs> same spot. And the oak trees are in a row that they're just walking down like, oh, there's a lollipop, there's a lollipop, there's a lollipop. And, and, and so we have these little bushes up there. 
So it failed. We planted uh, 600 oaks to the acre, I think, and 600, or maybe it was 1,000 oaks to the acre and 1,000 pines to the acre. Um, up where we were doing that cut up on uh, on top, up in the big woods, the shelterwood harvest, which is a, is a natural regeneration, reseeding. Um, and there's some techniques involved with that. We have places up there that we have 10,000 seedlings per acre. I mean, it's a carpet of them in the fall up there. Um, so, you know, the, the premise there is that, well, even with deer population and all of that, some enough of them are going to survive to get up to that point where they're going to be above the browse line of the deer. But along with that is that we need to shoot a lot of deer to, you know, keep, uh, to discourage them or to, or to keep them out of there, which is a part of why I bring other people in. And I'm always encouraging people to shoot does or young bucks. Even. Yeah. I, like I, could, I was out here a couple of years ago and you had kind of a number in your head of what you were hoping to see. Just yeah. trail cam images and other things, what you're hoping to see come off in does. Yeah. I said it does for trying to get some red oaks to get yep. Yep. big enough to grow up. And, uh, we were, everything was, uh, all our cropland was in, uh, production at that time. So, um, it's now in CRP. Um, and so, you know, it's a really, it's, you know, sort of a constant balance of, uh, science and feel and art. Um, but that, you know, that's a big part of what's driving me. So from a, from a deer hunting perspective, of course I want good hunting. And of course, I want to see a certain amount of deer, but I also want to balance that ecosystem and balance the, the you know, I, I want to grow those oaks a hundred years from now, this fam, this farm is going to be in my family. And a hundred years from now, those oaks that are up there now that we're cutting are going to be replaced if we do this correctly um, by the seedlings that are 10,000 to the acre up there. Yeah. And a hundred years from now, there'll be deer and turkeys eating acorns. Deer and tear crazy, and there'll be 50 or 60 of those trees left, the best ones. Yeah. Um, and, and so that's a part of my management strategy. So when I say there are too many deer, that's what my perspective is on it. Um, I know hunters, and I know a couple, I have a couple of clients that all they want is more deer. And, you know, the truth is they don't have the deer that we have. I mean, I, yeah, I, I go with, I understand their feeling that, yeah, I want to see more deer. Well, it's because they don't see that many. You know, maybe like Giannis is talking about where, where he's at up there. And so we do things that we can, you know, to encourage that. But the cool thing to me about good forest management and good woodland management, uh, I like to call it woods rather than forest, uh, is that it really is compatible with good wildlife habitat. Um, turkey hunting. I mean, it's just beautiful up there. Squirrel hunting is still great up there. Yep. Um, when you... You know, you open up those clear cuts and there's a lot of brush. There's rabbits in there. You clear cut those aspen stands and we didn't, I hadn't seen a rough grouse or heard a rough grouse here for years. And in 2001, when we did the first couple of clear cuts that we did of aspen, two years later, boom, 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 we heard the John Deere tractor up there. That's you know, that nice rough noise, grouse. Man. I love that noise. Some and we're, to, yeah, I always think there's some guy trying to get his lawnmower started. Oh, nope, it's a grouse. Yeah. Well, so the interesting thing to me, I was having a conversation with one of the wildlife biology students last night. Um, you know, the uh, Wild Turkey Federation, Pheasants Forever, uh, uh, Trout Unlimited. Um, well, those are the three that I can think of. What, what's the number one thing all of those organizations do? Habitat. Habitat. Whitetails will live anywhere. Yeah. Those other species have to have habitat, a specific kind of habitat. And, you know, Pheasants Forever say, says, build it and they will come. Yeah. And I, I don't care that much about pheasants. I would, if there was a way to, uh, to, um, I, I wish I could stock grouse. I mean, it's just not, po you know, rough yeah. grouse, it's not possible. So the thing that I can do is to try to, um, do things about the uh, in, in the habitat, and it's good forest management. And quite honestly, it's good economic forest management too. We took that popple off at you know fifty or sixty years, and we were getting nice pulpwood out of it. We were getting nice bolt logs out of it. Um, and uh, oh, and woodcock is the other thing, of course, that we have go through here. And, and I'm working with the Fish and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service on a on a plan for our bottom in there to to make that less mature. Um, because the woodcock like that better. Woodcock and grouse kind of like the same habitat. Yeah, exactly. So whitetails, on the other hand, hell, they'll live in your backyard, you know? So 
and so I, that seems to be one of the, the differences and I, that was pointed out to me. I learned, learned not only from you last night did I learn a few things, but um, from talking with those folks, uh, a, a, a wildlife biology student and, and then the big game manager. And uh, so those are the kinds of things that are in my mind when I'm not, when I'm working on this property and thinking about how we want to manage this property, but also when I'm working with my clients, you know, properties are, are unique, but, Driftless area is still the driftless, and most of my clients are in the driftless area. So, yeah. Yeah. all right. So, tell me, t- talk about the standard for a minute. So, two thousand and five, my wife and I just built that cabin up there, and I just popped that little road that comes down through that you guys walked down, and uh, <clears throat> we had seen this deer. In fact, I'm pretty sure I actually shot that deer the year before. Shot him and hit him. Missed, yeah, hit him, nicked him in the back leg. With uh, what? With a rifle. Oh. And uh, standard. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm almost sure that he did. I, I, you know how? It's easy to tell a story about the deer you killed, but the ones that bother you are the ones that, that you missed or that got uh, away. I know exactly <laughs> what you're talking about. And, uh, <clears throat> I'm almost sure it was that deer. It was certainly that gene. Big, wide, heavy. It's not super tall. But it's, you know, 20, when it was green, it was two feet inside. You know, 16 points, lots of stuff on it. Um, and I had seen, it, 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 that deer was aged at four years old. Okay. So, you know, he got there pretty quick. He dodged a lot of bullets, man. And he got there pretty damn quick, yeah. Anyway, um, that, the year before, I nicked this buck that, in my mind, looked an awful lot like, and it hit him in the, in the back leg really just a horrible situation. One of those shots that, you know, I think I talked about this before. Um, if you can put the bullet back in the gun, you do man, it. Man, I would just, I, I rarely, I don't regret any shot that I didn't take, but that was one of those shots that I regretted taking. Because yeah. I, cu- I should have killed him with the first shot, and then, you know, each shot after that gets more and more desperate, and I shot at that deer four times, and I should have killed him with the first shot because I had him. And then just. And I just got. I, I ran up over a hill. Uh, I, know, yeah, and, oh. I, know, I know how stuff goes, man. So the next year, my wife and I are driving down on that little road in this little beater Jeep that I had, and this deer gets up out of the this brush alongside that road and just lumbers into the woods. And I went. And my wife, who doesn't get excited about deer, she goes, oh, my God. <laughs> Look at the size of that thing. And she's all excited about it. And, you know, and I'm like, I mean, I'm just like, I couldn't even talk. Because it's going away, maybe a two foot wide white tail going away from you looks like a moose, you know, and it's going away from me going down this hill. We get down to the buildings and uh, down here to the farm and we're doing a couple of things. And I, I kind of came up with this idea that, well, you know, I think that's where he lives. That's where he beds. So I got the old tractor out and put the brush hog on and took a ladder stand and a hanger put that back there and I just drove back in the valley. Nothing happened in here. Just, just a hard. guy out doing a little brush hogging, you know? So I took a little sweep through the brush and the stuff that was back there, clearing the little trail, got near this tree. That's all oh, 40 yards from where that, that bedding area was left the brush hog running, left the tractor running, put it in neutral, got out, strapped that thing to this elm tree. That is, you know, maybe 18 inches in diameter, strapped that thing to it. And I'm kind of a big guy. It was probably a, it's not a big enough tree. Got that uh, hanger up there in the tree. Got back down. Got back in the tractor and drove like nothing happened in here. We're just, you know, brush hogging. Two weeks later, uh, we had an early um, urnabuck uh, hunt. But you could kill a buck if you had a doe tag, which I did have. And, uh, and sure enough, I got up in that. I get up in that stand, I'm in, and I'm holding on to a limb. Got my rifle in my other hand. I'm holding on to a limb. I'm in that stand 15 minutes. Doe comes up out of the bottom, and I hear, Burr. and this brush comes around the corner, and it's his antlers. He walked up, and this is the end of October. And he walks up out of that bottom 35 yards, brings his head up, shot him right in the chest, went over backwards. I mean, just like I planned it, it happened, and you patterned him. I, it was just, it was crazy. So my dad uh, was still hunting at the time, and and so that was 2005, 10 years ago. And my nephew Sam, who uh, hunts with us and, and 
Well, great kid, great hunter, very good hunter. Um, on the radio goes, Uncle Duck. Yeah. Did you shoot? Yeah. Because he can, they're they're off a ways, and and so I can. He's relaying that to my father, who doesn't hear very well. <laughs> relaying all this information, he goes. Grandpa wants to know how big it is because he knew I wouldn't have pulled the trigger unless. And I just told him, Sam, he isn't going to believe it. And I mean, that was. I mean, it was. And uh, the jump went from 135 inches to, you know, 192 inches, and that's a, that's a leap. Um, There's not a buck hunter in this country, in the world, that wouldn't want to have that deer. Oh, on his wall. So talk about. <laughs> we're we're running out of time. We're running out of, uh, into our self-imposed time limit. But talk about um, <laughs> the what happened with the taxidermist and stuff like that. Oh, so, so my dad has this little white Chevy S10 pickup that he still has, and. Uh, so this is the end of October. It's kind of a warm day. We hang the thing up in the. In the so I didn't get a whole lot of pictures of it. You, you see the one there was hanging up in the shed, and I call it. I never had a deer mounted before, so I call this taxidermist over in Bear Valley, and and I kind of describe. He says, "Well, how big is it?" And I was like, "Well, I I didn't measure it or anything." I said, "It's I I'm I have a size 13 shoe, and I can put two of them inside the horns." He goes, "So you're gonna want to get that." thing over here because it's warm and the skin will start to, I don't know, he's telling me all this stuff. I'm like, yeah, okay. So we dropped that thing in the back of Dad's S10 pickup. Now it looks like, a, you know, it's a big deer, but now it looks like a moose laying in there. By the time we get over to Bear Valley, we got cars behind us, you know, the lights on it. We pull in, and this guy mounts a lot of deer. And we pull in, I walk up to Bill, and I said, uh, so, hey, I'm the guy who called about the, and he goes, oh, well, let's go and take a look at it. And there's trucks lined up, you know, guys are going to back in and they're going to unload them and they, they're, because they're working on, you know, he's got a whole assembly line there getting the skin off them and everything. He walks down there, takes one look at it, turns around and says, get all these other trucks the hell out of the way. We're backing that one up in here right now. <laughs> so we back it up in there. And of course they've got a, a, a rig that they use to pull the skin off to the head. And uh, the guy, old guy there stands there and looks at me, he says, you know, if I killed that deer, I'd get that whole damn thing mounted. <laughs> <laughs> and I got a place to put it. So, uh, so they, you know, they, they get it scun and, and, uh, take it in. The guy starts working on the head. And so a bunch of dudes standing around there and, you know, and I don't, I only know a couple of these guys, but everybody starts shouting out numbers and throwing then their guys, writing it down and throwing five bucks into a hat, guessing how many inches it is. Guys are like, 175. Oh, you're full of shit. That's way bigger than 175. And uh, writes it down and. Nobody guessed 200, and I said, okay, I'll say 200. Dude was right on the, the green scored it at 192. Dude would hit it right on the head. Oh, there. Right? Yeah. I don't know what he won, but it was, it was a pile of money. <laughs> that was quite a night. It was, you know, it was quite a, quite a, quite a show. Nice buck next year. Yeah. He might have been a dead buck next year. Well, he was a dead buck next year. No, but I mean, like he's old. He was getting up there. I mean, yeah, he was four-year-old deer, yeah. What would he have been like at five? Well, I don't know. They, these five-year-old deer, they start getting kind of rare, man. <laughs> yeah. So. No, I don't, he would have kept getting bigger, right? I, I Yeah, I certainly think so. Yeah, we were wondering that before. How how old do they really, how old could a deer get around here if it didn't get hit by a car or shot or, you know, whatever? And, I, you know, eight or nine, I think, is is probably, the you know, the, the limit of it, but. You know, uh, I, oh, go ahead. But it was, th- I mean, that, it, personally, once that happened, uh, that's, that's when I said, well, okay, so the rule about having the next buck having to be bigger than the one you shot this year, that changes now. So, um, you know, so otherwise I would have never shot, it, probably shoot another deer in the rest of my life on this place. But um, you want to know what a good podcast host I am? I don't even give a shit about big white tails. I know you don't. I want to kill a big. The only thing I want to kill a big giant one of is mule deer. Well, you know, I find you know, it remarkable. You know, you know I, might, I might have just shot a Boone or musk ox. <laughs> I didn't sure. know that. I'm not sure yet. But I might have got a Boone or musk ox. Huh? The coveted Boone and Crockett musk ox. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, but here's the thing. Doug and I have our, I, I want to wrap her up. I want to do, right. I want to do my concluding thoughts. Doug and I have argued about this endlessly because 
I, I've had the fortune, the good fortune of, of – I've never shot anything on this place, I don't think. You haven't, and I – I haven't even shot a turkey out here. No, you have not. I don't shoot anything on Doug's property, but Doug – You haven't even shot a rabbit on this property. Yes, I have. No. Oh, those shot. rabbits were on it's up the on, on the Schmidt's place. Yeah. Oh, what about those mallards? That oh. was on my cousin's place. Yeah, every guy within thirty miles of here is a Duran. Doug hasn't even met a lot of his cousins, so it was on a Duran place, right? Where the mallards were. Yeah, yeah, and the Schmidt place was that that big rabbit place. So, but I I had where I took a a couple first not for a second time hunters out on Doug's place. And Doug has this thing like, when people come out to Hunter's place, Doug shows you the top shelf deer. And Doug says, if you're going to shoot a buck on my property, have it be that he'll fit in. He would fit in with those bucks. So it's not like, like he doesn't tell you, like, oh, it's got to be blank inches. Or it's got to be out of the ears. He just says, it should have its home in this in this collection of bucks is what we're trying to do here. However, you're gracious enough where you say to people who are making their first visit to the farm, if you see a buck and you're excited about getting that buck and that for you is like your benchmark, like that's what you want, go ahead. The second time you come out, screw you. Yeah. You got to shoot off the top shelf. As what? I told the neighbor kid the other day, uh, or last year, I should say, uh, he, uh, I'm sorry. No, but, but I'll say we have, like, I've played devil's advocate with you a lot about the thing about, like, meat hunting or just shooting bucks, like, not caring about the antlers. Yeah. And I would say that over the years that I've been friends with you, you have enlightened me. And move me in the direction of when it comes to whitetails that, like we were talking about, Aldo Leopold said last night, yep. that a hunter is like a forester. When you pick a tree and strike it with your axe, you're making your mark on the landscape, right? And I've come to see through you about uh, managing whitetails, okay, that they're not ex- that they're not contradictory ideas. The managing for for opportunity and meat harvest is not incompatible with managing for mature bucks. But we have thought about this a lot, and seeing what's happened out here and, and sort of the, the good times and fun that happened out here ha- has been educational for me. And I've taken that and explained that to a lot of other people because I just haven't really been. I moved out west, you know. Yeah. When I, as soon as I could, and I got out of the world of whitetails a little bit, and it's just been an interesting, like sort of my lens back into the whitetail culture has been here, and it's been it's been very informative. That's my concluding thought. But but I I've kicked and screamed through these discussions, but I do see what you're doing, and I see what you're after, and I think that people need to make sense of it. And people who are just getting into hunting because they want to harvest their own food and stuff. They might be like, oh, yeah, trophy hunters, blah, blah, blah. I think you need to take some time and, and, and read up on this stuff because it's not as simple as you might think it is. Deer. Long-term deer management, quality hunting now, quality hunting for your kids, quality hunting for your grandkids, without those 10-year, 20-year gaps where it sucks, mm-hmm. isn't just – it just doesn't happen on its own. And thought and science, thought, science, and restraint play into that stuff. That's my concluding thoughts. Yanni, big antlers are magical, and it's so easy to demonize them. And oftentimes, I think the whole trophy hunter thing is demonized now, or people want to do that and, and make it a bad thing. But like getting all those the community together around your truck to look at those antlers. There's community going on there, and it's special, you know, and it's a good thing to have that, to have everybody come around and talk about it and being excited about it. And I don't know whatever turned me on to being excited about big antlers. Obviously, media has something to do with it, but Helen Show, a recent uh, meat eater, 
turn you know our our uh, associate is now a hunter killed her first elk um if she was asking me about antlers didn't really get it wasn't really excited about it shot her elk was at my house we're butchering up her elk and we happened to be out in the garage and there's a elk head on one wall and a mule deer on another wall she got to looking at them asked up a couple questions i answered them an hour later she's like can we take one of those down you know, so I can hold it and feel it and look at it. And she kind of admires it and whatever. And by the time she left that evening, she's like, I kind of want to shoot a buck, you know. <laughs> like, there's something <laughs> special about that, you know. Like, wh- what is it? I don't know, but they're magical. Can I have a second concluding that, thought? Th- that's my concluding thought. I want a second one. The bucks we're talking about and, like, the standard and stuff, we're not talking about some bucks that are raised behind a fence and they bring in, like, some jar of semen and inseminate a bunch of does and then you go down and buy them at a deer sale. These are real bucks. Yeah, they sure are. They're getting run over by cars, shot at, surviving. They're real damn deer. Like genuine, real, wild bucks. They're gorgeous. They really are. And I'll tell you something, um, and I'll try to make it part of my concluding thought. That it's got to be a concluding thought. My, uh, I get two just because it's my podcast. All right. The standard uh, within a one-mile radius of here since 2005, there have been at least three bucks bigger than that one killed here within a mile of this place. Is that right? One-mile radius, yeah. Wow. Yeah. I mean, bigger horns. There are more inches of horns, maybe not as massive or or whatever, but more inches in the way they score them. Uh, Thanks once again for putting into words – in a way that I struggle with. That's one of my favorite things about Steve Ranella. Uh, it is, you know, deer hunting is a part of what we're trying to do with our property. And I think it should be a part of uh, the overall view of an area. I think it's a big part of the future. It's been a part of the past and it's certainly part of the present and it's going to be a big part of the future of this area hunting in general and it's really economically I think is going to be a big part of this area um, and uh, I love the Driftless area, I love the Casanova area, Westford Township, Richland County, uh, Baraboo River, Willow Creek and uh, I just really appreciate that we've been able to bring some attention to it and uh, have a lot of fun while we're doing that yes sir yes sir and doug's uh cohort's got a turkey tag still so tomorrow gonna be up right and early now you guys i think had to sleep in we didn't i didn't get to kill this morning so i get to go out again with ty right? well i'm gonna go out and sit against the tree up in the brush you are yeah i'm not even gonna bring I, my call i'm not even gonna bring a call i was just googling oh i'm just you. observing i know you're coming all right Thanks for tuning in, Meteor Podcast. Oh, a couple things. Go to um, uh, Yanni's t-shirt website, hunttoeat.com, buy a Hunt to Eat t-shirt. If you're single, that'll solve your problems when you got one of those t-shirts on because the ladies are going to look at you and they're going to be like, that man fills the freezer. That man brings home the bacon. Um, 24 bucks. He's always out of stock, but he's stocking up, right? Yep. Tell him the website. www.hunt2eat.com. Not numeral. Hunt, T-O. Yep. H-U-N-T, T-O-E-A-T. Yep. Buy one of Yanni's t-shirts. Very important. Um, Doug Duran, Lone Oak Interests. That's right. If you got a chunk of ground and you want to talk to someone, uh, he doesn't bill you on the initial phone call. Call Doug Dern, talk about land, whatnot. You'll be shooting giant bucks pretty soon. Uh, Meat Eater, the TV show, not free. Well, it is free if you got TV. If you don't have TV, meateater.vhx.tv. Download and stream Meat Eater all night and all day. Um, Thanks for joining us. Take care.